Hello, and welcome back to the DM's Book Club, or the Dungeon Master's Book Club, if, like me, you like to spice it up every now and then. My name <laughs> is Ryan, and frequently with these introductions, I spend no time at all planning them, and all the time trying to make Fiona laugh. That's right, Fiona, she's trying not to laugh, but I've just introduced her, so now she can talk. Hello. Brilliant, thank you. Yes, well, you make me laugh all the time, Ryan, so I don't, I don't think it's a win, it's just, it's just something that we do now, it's a tradition, and if it doesn't happen, <laughs> bad things are going to happen. You know. Oh dear. Oh, no pressure or anything. <laughs> How are you? You're right. Yes, I am really good, thank you. Really good. Trying to um, put my brain on charge. I've had lots of water and now I'm at least up to 15%. So I'm actually... 15? Fine. Yeah. Oh God, last week you were at 3%? Maybe yeah, 2 or 3, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 500% or oh. <laughs> 500% more you can't beat those results fantastic yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you are well <laughs> have you been preparing something for me and for us as an audience I have indeed I have indeed so obviously last time we looked started looking into the world of Eberron and looking at the different sort of ways you can create like a very simple encounter there using uh, encounter of the week that is like a regular series on D&D Beyond and I was just like you know what I want to find out a bit more about Eberron what else is new like you know we can look at the world and stuff but actually I want to see what you know as a as a as a player what kind of different beings could I be and actually in Eberron they introduce at least four new unique sorry that was a, I, I had a bit of a weird thing there is it new unique <laughs> it's a tongue twister oh it is yeah anyway sorry i'm not gonna try i know that i'm gonna just muck that one up so if there are unique races that have been sort of canonized or sort of put into actual print so that you don't have to spend hours trying to piece things together from other customized races that they've put on forums or maybe even the dm's guild which haven't necessarily been play tested but also mm. if you are someone that's playing say in the Adventurous League, one of their rules, um, I don't know if you know this, Ryan, so you have to at least use the player's handbook and then you can choose one of the book of your choosing to influence your character creation. So obviously one of them could obviously be Eberron and you could use one of the uh, new races from that. So I thought, let's have a quick dive in to see what these uh, new four races are. Yeah, they, they are really cool. Like mm. looking through this chapter, which is chapter one, I believe, in mm -hmm. uh, the book. Yeah, God. Really cool stuff, really cool stuff. And as a little side note as well, so they've, they've obviously, Eberron is a very different world and they've given a lot of the other races a bit of a, an overdoing and to sort of put them into the Eberron world and there are some really cool changes they've got in there. So go and have a look at the whole chapter. It's really, really good. As you say, we're going to be focusing on the four new ones, aren't we? So where do you want to start? What's your, what's, what's your favourite or what's alphabetically first? <laughs> I see what you did there because I was like I don't have a favorite and then you like <laughs> that one yes well let's start with the alphabetical one shall we though that's a little in joke between me and Ryan which no one will ever see the light of day <laughs> um let's start with the race of changelings so changelings which people may know of from various fairy tales and stuff are basically a race that can change their appearance at will and just even having just that sentence is incredible. <laughs> mm. If you've ever wanted to, to play any sort of D&D, &D, at some point you will have seen a doppelganger, right? The doppelganger is one of those really famous monsters that looks like a sort of weird, skinny alien person and can change themselves to look like any member of the party so they can follow be followed around and can pretend to be part of the party and just really wind the players up. They're fantastic. And they've made a character. They've made a natural playable race that has that sort of generic ability which is amazing just looking at it in general so it gives sort of a maybe a little bit of history or a bit of law to be like how did the changelings come to be and it talks about like how there was a person called jess who had a hundred children as, as one often does in D, &D apparently mm -hmm. and her rivals were conspiring against her to plan to kill all of her children so she prayed to the god of the traveler which i think some people may know from critical role there's someone mm -hmm. who's a tricksty sort of mysterious sort of character and so this person sort of gave this ability for all of our children to remain hidden and to change their facades so that it can always get a way out or be able to sort of um, hide their true nature from other people that may want to hurt them. And I guess it's a very sort of typical sort of hero story where like you are protected, but you have a gift, which could also be a curse because you could never truly know who you are, but you can choose whoever you want to be. But does anyone know who you are underneath? So mm. yeah, absolutely love that sort of concept for sure. I think I love about changelings and how how it goes about trying to explain 
what they are as well is how do you describe a person if they can change what they are at will mm. like what's the fundamental building blocks of, of your identity if everything about your parents is fickle and can change at a moment's notice and how it describes that is really really interesting so how would you describe a changeling that isn't change like what's their natural neutral form like well, that's pretty much it. They are just sort of a neutral, almost as if, if you imagine sort of a like a black and white uh, photograph of somebody, but all the colour is just seeped out of it completely. So it is just a sort of state of... I, I Actually, it talks about it being sort of white or neutral, like white silver hair, sort of a white pallid colour. But I, even for me, I just would say even maybe like a monotone grey, if I was mm. going to put my own flavour on it, because they're so devoid of colour. Almost, uh, I guess, in real life, you would maybe compare it to maybe people who have albino skin. They just do not have the pigment in it. A big example of this, of being, someone being able to change and their appearance and look like other people, obviously, is uh, Mystique from X-Men. But mm. she, obviously, is very deliberately bright and vibrant, so it's very hard for her to, I guess, it's very hard, hard for her in her natural form to sort of hide herself because she's so bright. But then compared to changelings that just have no colour, nothing, and they just, as a result, seem as scary, I guess, because that when you think of stuff maybe like the Shadowfell, where it's described as a place that just is devoid of colour, and you see the colour maybe being sapped off from like your torchlight or, or from like your clothing, perhaps, because mm. just the way the, the plane is, and then you see someone who's just devoid of colour, oh, it just makes me think of like that person's just been sapped of their energy, and it's something mysterious and, and strange, and therefore you don't trust it, you don't, yeah. you don't want that to happen to you, and so that's that's what change things look like, but yeah. that does not necessarily reflect who they are per se yeah. as, a, as, a, as their nature. I always think of them as being a little bit like porcelain dolls. Mm. You know, there's horrible sort of children's toys they get with those blank china like faces. Like they, yeah, they're very, very creepy looking. And you could imagine how, even though a changeling may have absolutely no evil in them whatsoever, that mistrust that comes from the strange appearance, the devoid of all colour and, and life sort of look to them, the fact that they can change themselves to look like anybody they want. It, there's a lot of suspicion there. And I, I, you can see these people getting ostracised or being mm. persecuted even. Um, but yeah, tell me about, so what's it like to play a changeling? What, what changes does it make to your character sheet? Yeah, so obviously you get the skill of the shape changer. So you, for an action, you can change how you look and speak. Uh, you can duplicate the appearance of a creature that you have... Uh, you, sorry, you can't duplicate the appearance of a creature you have never seen, which makes sense, because obviously it's a bit like the polymorph spell. If you have no idea what the creature is, maybe like, I want, to, I want to polymorph it into a triceratops, and you've never seen one, well, that's a bit sort of cheating and stuff, so that makes sense here. But the other sort of uh, requirement for changing your appearance is just that you must adopt to form that has the same basic arrangement of limbs that you have so mm. you can't suddenly have wings or you can't suddenly have a serpent's tail or stuff like that you still have to look vaguely humanoid and actually like you said it is something where you can just be anyone at the drop of a hat someone that in most sort of cultures have the basic arrangement of limbs certainly humanoid races in the sense of like you know elves dwarves even to the point of like uh, lizard folk or, or even tabaxi they have the same arrangement of limbs but you know they if you can change into being any of these characters you can really be a part of any party like i can imagine being a changeling in an adventuring party and just never tell anyone because i'm always just appearing like this because the shapes change your skill lasts until you change your persona again you you don't have a time limit you don't have like oh and that's the, that's the difference between those people who can who have the shape changer ability and those people who have um alter self or, or change appearance spells because they have to keep concentrating and change it on the hour whereas you don't necessarily need to concentrate whilst you're in shape changer form exactly not having concentration is a really big one and Unlike other spells, this is not an illusion. You have actually appeared as that person. So anyone with true sight will see that person. They won't see sort of through this sort of illusion, which I always find interesting. Mm. But the clothing and equipment doesn't change. So that is the one limitation from this. You can't make yourself look like a really rich nobleman without actually wearing their clothes. So mm -hmm. there are limitations to it. But yeah, I could just imagine having great fun with somebody like this in a with any could party. Could, could you? you? Could you, oh, you could be <laughs> loads of fun just changing and pretending to be people and, and just getting kinds of... Oh, yeah. <laughs> I always like a race that gives you um, skill proficiencies as well. So just having any like deception, insight, 
mm. intimidation, persuasion, you get two of them. And it's all charisma based stuff and you get plus two charisma. So that's quite fun. Yeah. And I'll say as well, because it, it mentions it. And I think, think this is actually quite an interesting point that if you're not sure, like, oh, what, you know, how often do you, are you going to change your, your appearance and stuff? Like, is it just something that you do every day? Because it talks about you, you change shape and you change your appearance, like how others would change clothes, which again, I was like, oh, whoa, that's such a, a cool sort of thing. But like, they have sort of two levels of it. You have just a casual shape where you have no depth to it, no history, no nothing. You're just like, oh, quick, I need to escape or, oh, I, I need to go out to the shops. Um, mm. I, I don't know. I need I need to go to um, Tesco's, but it's only the people who work for the NHS or the elderly. So I have to, <laughs> have to change my appearance to get in. And they're called masks because it's just like, oh, I'll just put it over. And if obviously if people look too deeply, then they'll realize that it's not who I am, but it's mm-hmm. enough to get by in a crowd. It's enough to escape, you know, if you're down a couple of streets for, uh, running from the uh, the police force or the guard and you just disappear because you've just turned into somebody else and you just a bit like Assassin's Creed, essentially. So there's that. And then you have something called personas. It's where you've built up uh, a character or a facade over some time. So they have certain beliefs, they have certain history, or they have certain moods and stuff, which you have honed in on as this is the person I'm playing. So a proper, again, because we've sort of talked about it a little bit then, was like they are sort of maybe prone to be more grifted or a bit more sort of like wheeling and dealing because they can have all these different personas. So I'm thinking of like um, The Hustle, where you have, you know, like Adrian Lester's character being the inside man who's someone that's really really confident but then also then playing someone who is a plumber who changes the bag at the last minute etc which you could all do but i think with personas the interesting thing i thought is that personas can be shared between multiple changelings Mm -hmm. so you could have for example a healer gives the example of a healer in a village that's just always been there just always been around, I've never aged, never done anything, but has always given the best service, given the, the, everything that's great. And it's because the family of changelings just runs that as their persona. And it's just something that they just take down from, hmm. from family member to family member. And I just thought that was such a cool concept, that idea that you, the way you connect with other changelings is that you can share a persona and yeah. you can share this sort of connection and if one of you dies, you still have a part of them because you've played this role, yeah, I guess. You literally can become them. You, you can't let anybody go because you you are the same person they are. But they all have their little, like, intricacies in, in, in how they sort of build themselves up. Like, the, I like the examples they give of, like, so, so that person may be called Jin, but it might be Jin with the vivid blue eyes or mm. Jin with the golden nails because your changeling always has golden nails regardless of what form they take because that's just your thing like it's just a part of your identity it's interesting to imagine playing a character like that where everything about a character's normal sort of definition their their race or their appearance or even their name or the way they sound you can change that as a drop of the hat and i think actually playing that must be really interesting as well because either you've got to really dive in and just throw yourself at accents and do a lot of acting and really go for it or or you play it in a different way where you're a bit more neutral with just like describing what you do and saying oh my person has looking like this and sounds like this and and do it a little bit more neutrally but yeah they're really really cool i could talk about changing things all day they're really i know you can (laughs) I've got one in my campaign. If you, if if you're in a subtle hinting, is uh is you know not enough and oh, really really cool. So tell me about another one. If, if it's not a change thing, what what other new race have you got for me? So we talked a bit about them last time. The Kalashtar, who are a very interesting race. They're called a compound people, which again I was like, whoa, that sort of statement sort of really jumps out the page at you. But it's the idea that they are a, a race that's created from the union of humanity and renegade spirits from the plane of dreams. And you're like, <laughs> oh, that's an interesting sentence. I want to I want to just go in there. So they are seen as sort of wise, sorry, spiritual people. Like they are, they sort of have this influence and impacted on by things from another plane that can't directly communicate with them. But it's something that it's like, it's almost like a gut feeling. You are pushed in certain ways where you might have differing like opinions. So if you are like, I don't know, um, lawful good and you like have to be rules, you might have a a spirit that is uh, joined to you that is chaotic good and actually may try and force you to do things or influence you to do things that you would not normally do and having those inner conflicts is actually quite an interesting one yeah it doesn't have to match with your character i love that that's such a really really cool idea that that just happens to a lot of us and i will say what when i was thinking about like 
this idea of uh, the Kalashtar, like having another person in your head, essentially. That's not, again, not necessarily talking. You see it all the time in like films and stuff where people are talking out loud to a ghost only they can see or, 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 or someone that's uh, in their skin or, or sharing their sort of psyche. And people are look, looking, looking at them, why are you talking to yourself? Like, I'm not talking to myself. And <laughs> that's why I quite like with the Kalashtar, there is a quirks table, which um, has that sort of thing in it. Yes, yeah, so you've yeah, got- Yeah, there's all kinds of stuff that, that really just, Oh, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Uh, oh, I looked at the wrong table there. You prefer telepathy over speaking aloud. That sounds amazing. Because again, you have this uh, with the spirit that you are connected to. You have something called mind link as one of your abilities where you can, within 10 feet of you, you can pick a, a creature or a target, sorry, and you can speak to them for an hour and give them the ability to speak, speak back to you. And certainly when you're starting at such a low level, if you're just starting out, having the ability to communicate with someone without actually speaking is so valuable valuable because the amount of times you're hiding from someone or you're trying to be quiet and whispering i can imagine just uh, like a kalashtar and their party uh, or party member just sitting in a tavern and not speaking for a whole hour just <laughs> just, just <laughs> having like just staring contest at each other as they're sort of like just communicating in that way and not um, even realizing it just, just purely because it's like a quirk of your personality not even like yeah no i love that you'd have to give have a good thought about how your spirit worked in that arrangement like is your spirit actively getting involved and translating for you telepathy like in that sort of telepathic way or mm. is it just something you can do and every now and then you have these weird dreams like i can imagine deciding how involved your spirit was mm. would be really really interesting but i have to say of all of the stats the dual mind one is one of those little subtle things advantage on a wisdom saving throws in mm. D D, that's very useful that's really useful <laughs> Yeah, having the ability, because like, yeah, quite a lot of magic, like quite a lot of the saves have, are usually wisdom or anything like that. So yeah, being able to have that advantage on them is incredible. And for me, what one thing I quite like back, so going back to this whole, um, giving this race a sort of a flavor of a history as well, connecting to sort of this idea that you have psionic powers, because I, I believe, and this is where we'll probably get the old comment saying, oh, that's not right. There was a class in Unearthed Arcana called the Scion. And I think the Kalashtar was sort of based on that because you have sort of psionic abilities of some sort. You are resistant to quite a lot of psychic damage, which again, is very useful if you've got advantage on all, all wisdom saving throws and resistance to psychic damage. Like my, maybe it does seem quite particular, but again, in Eberron, there's probably quite a lot of encounters that do involve psychic damage, certainly if you've got quite a lot of uh, Kalashtar out there. So going back to sort of the history of it, so, or, or like sort of the thing of the race, so they talk about the Dreaming Dark. I was so about to ask you about this yes. horrible concept that is the Dreaming Dark. It's, it's horrible. Oh, it's so, I love it. So essentially, the Plane of Dreams clearly has some, had, sorry, some sort of war going on between these sort of spirits and this looming presence of sort of an unknowable called the Dreaming Dark, where these evil spirits are sort of trying to take over and forcing rebel spirits to, to leave and stuff and i don't know oh god this is what i can't remember what she's called um but there was a book series called the dark is rising way back in like the early 90s stuff where you had this idea of this horrible darkness and it was always infecting people mm. and you had uh, the protagonist was called will they had symbols um it was there was a film made about it the film had christopher eccleston in as an evil person and it was very weird that's, that's, <laughs> there's some random facts for that's allowed to be an evil person no he's i to be honest i love christopher eccleston because he's 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 my doctor who he obviously he's he's an northerner he's great he only got one series and it was really rubbish uh, <laughs> but but then he, he went to hollywood and did this film it wasn't a great film but he was playing he was playing a northerner on a horse which is great uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> what more do you need what more do you need but yes this idea of the dreaming dark again just a paragraph or two talking about these different so the the dream realm is called dal core and mm. you, again it's that sort of thing where i don't know much about it i assume maybe eberron talks about it a little bit more later on but i was just like oh this, this idea there's a plane of dreams and there are spirits there and possibly one day would you ever go to it what happens if a Kalashtar visits it does their Korra their spirit does that appear in front of them and manifest itself almost like um, a Patronus you know that mm. stuff like that that would be oh, really cool and it talks about this sort of the almost like an alien quality to them so instantly I got <laughs> images of and I know this sounds silly but Luna Lovegood again the idea of sort of talking yeah. out about yeah like to, I her talking about that yeah, yeah, it's just, just like happy and 
and just wonderful and just like everything's in its own place and yes. i know this and guided yeah. by some higher horrendously happy power that yeah. is just good in every way <laughs> yeah no i can see that that's really really cool if these people are um, sort of powered by a very you could say holy or, or, or positive dream spirit mm-hmm. tell me about something else maybe that's a bit more animalistic or a bit more sort of natural information so shifters are again a bit like a, a compound people they are sort of descendants of humans and life uh lycan ah uh, lycanthropes no i don't know basically <laughs> anything that's just keep going for it just no. keep, keep coming <laughs> <laughs> no, I will not rise to that bait. So essentially anything that's where something. So usually you see them in films. So werewolf is obviously the biggest one, but you can have stuff like werebores, were ravens, uh, were rats. Um, anything that you have a person at a certain time of the month uh, to do with the moon, uh, you change into <laughs> you change into a different form or forced to change oh. in a different form. <laughs> So these are the sort of descendants of those uh, people who have been wear touched uh, called shifters. And they are a unique race, which you can tell that they are wear touched because they have almost like bestial aspects of them. And mm. what happens during the fight, almost like uh, activating like a rage or, or any sort of um, uh, martial archetype, they can um, lean in to this uh, aspect and use the powers from sort of, again, their sort of uh, their racial traits to grow their fangs a little bit longer, to run much quicker than anyone else or uh, have really thick skin so that arrows bounce off them. Again, it, the line that really stood out for me it's like it walks the knife's edge between the wilds and the worlds around them and i was like Whoa. so really cool. it's like little bursts of bestial isn't it They're, these guys are in control or mm-hmm. supposedly in control but maybe if you've got that power do you use it maybe a little bit more than you should do you lean on it maybe a little bit more than you should and actually for all of the races these guys have a lot of options you've got as you, mm-hmm. you've kind of mentioned it the four different types of of shifter and, and all the different powers they've got but there are some Oh, there are some really cool sort of leans on it. So they all have a couple of things that make them sort of regular. They're all quite slight, quite short. They're like wiry in in, in the way they're built. I'm just having a look at the size and the mm. the weight of them on average. But they have dark vision. And they can shift, and it's the shifting that kind of gives most of the powers, right? And you, mm-hmm. you get temporary hit points if you shift as a, as a mechanics thing. But then, as you say, all these different things happen. I mean, of all of these four types. Was there one that kind of stuck with you as something that seemed quite cool? I found it interesting. So the four types are Beast Hide, Long Tooth, Swift Stride, and Wild Hunt. And looking at them, I thought, like, as a player, if I suddenly was just given these options, my initial reaction would be to go for Long Tooth. So these sort of, again, very werewolf type sort of traits. So your fangs and your claws grow longer and you have that sort of extra damage thing. But then looking at the others, like, I quite like swift stride the idea that you can run or you can catch up and stuff i thought that was pretty interesting and it talks about certainly with the swift stride talks about it almost like well because it compares it to other animals that obviously in the real world that you would know of so it talks about obviously a feed line aspect so you'd have that or a rat i just i just had this image of someone just becoming more rat like but mm. big and that ugh, that, <laughs> that made me feel so ugh about it but yeah i think i think I would try and be different. I would want to try something a bit different. So I think I'd probably go for the swift stride. I don't, what about you? Was there any that stuck out to you at all? I quite like the idea of just having somebody really hardy. Just the simplicity of the beast hide one and, mm. and the sort of the, the aspects of the bear. Just you can see somebody getting a bit grizzly or a bit heavier, a bit mm. like just tougher just temporarily yeah I think it would be useful to get through life but i think um we'd have picked the other two wild hunt also seemed quite cool just yes. the ability is more of a sort of perceptive and uh mental state than it is necessarily like physical like mm. your, your your shift makes you really quick on your toes and 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 you know like how birds and small animals move it's all yeah it's like a bird of movement, prey isn't it yeah like, yeah that sort of thing like i like the idea that yeah a second eyelid would sort of flick down that leaves your eyes open <gasps> and uh <laughs> yeah your eyes glow and oh and no, i could see that be really cool very owl like in, in in the way they sort of work yeah so their thing is advantage on wisdom checks and no creature within 30 feet of you can make an attack roll with advantage against you unless you're incapacitated that is such a throwaway line but my god that that's incredible. You you can not, you know, you will not have a surprised, you know, unless something really bad has happened, you will not get an attack with advantage on you. 
right from it's the really right cool. from the beginning yeah absolutely love it um, really useful actually like mm. I, I can imagine dm having all of these with advantage things and you're like no 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 i'm fine my head turns all the way around and i see it like <laughs> <laughs> but it's you know, they're really cool there's, there's an element of like oh, it's not quite twilight is it but like there's an element of, mm. of sort of animalistic oh no i could see that the shifters are really really cool but they're very natural they're very in touch with the animal world <laughs> Have you got any examples or final examples that maybe is a bit less natural, a bit more artificial? I see, I see that smooth wave, Ryan. I will ride so it. it. Smooth. Um, so I think one of the, I guess, not even obvious, I think one of the more popular races to come out and sort of be uh, finalised, I guess, in this new Eberron book is, of course, the Warforged, these sort of constructs that were built to fight in the last war and have now gained sort of sentience. Like the first sort of Warforged it sort of talks about in the history was sort of mindless automatons, which were just sent out to kill the enemy. And if they got killed or, or broken apart along the way, that was fine. But now, thanks to artificers, hey, hey, they've been sort of evolved slightly. So they're no longer just robots. They are now made of living wood and metal so they can feel pain and emotion. Mm. And they were described as sort of a steadfast ally, but then you can change it to be a cold-hearted killer and all that sort of thing, because they are a creature that looks humanoid, but has just no flesh and blood about them. And that's just, mm, again, they are incredible. Constructs. And I, I really like that as an idea. Well, actually, no, they're not constructs. They are humanoid, I believe. Unless <laughs> that's <laughs> sort of put in somewhere, because that, that's always an interesting one, because constructs have... From a D and D really boring perspective, a lot of sort of stuff that would make them a little bit different. I think they are humanoid in terms of that they are alive with with souls and and yeah. Yeah, it says living humanoids because um, the resting and healing magic and medicine checks still apply to them. They are not, uh, if you try and give them a healing potion, they can take it. It's not like, oh, God, what do we do to fix your arm? Do we tinker with it? Do we so? so I guess it's just giving it another twist on that, that it's not a throwaway weapon. It is actually a person or has personhood. And again, like I think that's it's something that I think people are starting to explore more, certainly with the rise of AI and having intelligent things that can track you. Like I recently got a, a gimbal for work and the fact <laughs> that it can track me as I'm doing stuff around around my room or around, and it's just because it recognizes my face. Oh, scary. It looks incredible, yeah. uh, but except when I'm in it, but it, is it yeah. It's, <laughs> is it yeah. alive? Mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously, all those sort of things. Now, Warforged I knew about for a long time beforehand, and mm -hmm. it was purely because there's a lot of conversations with D&D &D about the concept of min-maxing and mm. people who like to build very particular, very specialist classes and, and things to make themselves very, very optimized. And I knew for a long time before this book was released, maybe that Warforged were kind of deemed to be one of these classes that you could optimize and kind of push the boundaries of what is balanced in this game. So I was kind of not surprised to see them, but now that I do see them, I can kind of see why that is the case. Because mm. I mean, you've got a race here with, what is it? Plus two constitution, a mm -hmm. three dump stat of anything you want, which gets plus one, and then plus one bonus to AC. Mm -hmm. which is really, really powerful. And yeah, like stuff like you don't need to eat, drink or breathe. And I was like, oh, <laughs> that's that's all all possible hazards to do with like drowning or, or suffocating out because you just uh, go on. But I, I like, I did quite like the, the description for age though, because obviously most of these are the races that we've talked about. They age either at a sort of a, a humanoid uh, race of like 70, 80 years or, or whatnot. But uh, for, for, for um, I almost called them robots then, no, Warforged. For Warforged, they can live between two and 30 years but that's as far as they know. But the max lifespan is a mystery because they show yeah. no deterioration. No, like, one, no one's actually done it yet. Like like, <laughs> like all good computers, it still keeps going. It still turns yeah. on. But is it's there Apple anyone Mac. inside? Oh. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oh, God. And then they're always obsolete. And mm -hmm. you're like, why didn't you break? I can't get any of the security software on this. It's <laughs> with everything. But yeah, no, it's, it's they are really cool. It's a concept like how long do they last for? If you were at a Warforged and you were 28 years old at the beginning, of the campaign do you know if you're going to survive do you mm. know if you're aging like is that a plot point in itself it's really yeah. interesting sorry to totally 
diverge. But if you listen at all to the high rollers um, mm. and their D&D, I, they're not technically Warforged, but Mark Humes, who runs that campaign, has uh, a race of guardians, which is a very similar concept, these sort of constructed beings. And in that, they all have a limited lifespan. And that's almost a, a plot point for the campaign as much as it is mm-hmm. anything else. So yeah, I could see I could see that getting dumped in as, as a warforged thing. You, you know, maybe you do have a limit. Maybe you know that you're only going to last thirty years and you're on twenty eight, but you don't want to say anything because you think people would treat you differently. Yeah, and and going back to what you said, like when they start out, obviously they are they are a basic template. They look identical. There's no change. They all have a very basic, straightforward sort of uh, face mask on. Their armor is very similar. So when you're starting out, you it talks again, it does another table of a table of quirks, so that you are constantly maybe re- saying out loud um, what danger you are in. Like, <laughs> like almost like a danger of a Robinson type thing, <laughs> which yeah. again, I would absolutely love. But again, as time goes on, and you're spending time with not necessarily other warforges, but your your character is learning about the world and becoming more personable, then mm. you're less likely to use these, these things. Let's talk about how they don't have an interest in religion, which makes sense. But maybe later on, they want to seek like a higher purpose or deeper meaning because they have been created. But there's clearly mysteries in the world which they can't solve. And I, I thought that was really, really interesting. And I think the, the other thing I really, really loved about this is the naming. So when they're created, they are assigned a numerical designation because obviously they're in the military, they're being in in that. But then afterwards, maybe once they're decommissioned, they adopt nicknames that are either given by their comrades or what I thought was really amazing, just take on a human name of a fallen friend or mentor. And having that come out in a story, like, why are you called Stephen? (laughs) That's a terrible name, but like that's honoring someone else's friend because that's not again a bit like the changelings that's not who you are that's that's a name that you've taken and mm. you've you, you've made it something and it, but it shows compared to changelings perhaps it shows significance i guess yeah the name has been given to you it's a bit, but you're aware of that like i guess it's all these things you don't realize when you're young because your parents have given you a lot of your identity and your education and your name and how these things are mm-hmm. you don't really think about it because it's quite a natural thing and you've grown up with it for years and years as a kid and, and developed it but warforge just get plonked in mm-hmm. at adulthood with like here is your identity and you sort of think well hang on why and it's it's interesting. Yeah. I, I I like that sort of yeah that sort of thought about it. And and yeah, the difference is in when it talks about Warforge generally showing no emotion, then others just totally rebel against that and show as much emotion as they can because they can, which I think is really interesting. Yeah, and and the other thing sort of to mention about Warforge, like you said, sort of said about sort of the the plus AC with the armor, and whilst you live, the armor can't be removed from your body against your will, which sounds mm-hmm. frightening. <laughs> Um, but I quite like uh, sentries rest, so that you have to be inactive, emotionless state. So you appear in it, but it doesn't render you unconscious, so you can still see or hear, but you're in standby mode. And that, again, is quite powerful. If you're in a party, you go, okay, we're just going to put, uh, we're going to put Stephen on, on guard duty for a little bit, and then we'll come and relieve you. And then they're just always alert, I guess. So they don't get, say, a disadvantage for um, if someone's trying to sneak up on them because they are technically awake. They just, they just can't do anything until something happens and then they power up and get ready to go, I guess. Exactly. Oh, that's so cool. They, and, and you could you could have a lot of fun, I think, making one of these and making them super tough or super interesting. And mm-hmm. and they are alive, so they can still cast magic and they can they can do all the things a normal character would. So out of all these four, they're very, very different concepts. If I were to chuck you into a campaign right now, oh, no. which which way do you think you would go? Is there any that jump out to you? It's one of those things where I I think I would actually go for maybe maybe an odd choice, but I'd probably go for a shifter because I feel like the the stress of playing a changeling is horrific. I don't know how you managed to get through so many sessions where we're just like, we just want to probe this person more. And you're like, mm-mm, don't, because I've got to work extra hard there. <laughs> and then I love I love the idea of the Warforge, but again, it's that sort of thing where, and I know this is so bad of me, but I just it's so popular. 
so I don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think just the idea of having a shifter, like um, for me, when I when I picture um, someone who is uh, who who shifts, I think of like maybe Beauty and the Beast, but like Prince Adam or whatever he's called actually still has the facial features, slight you know slight facial features of a beast. That's what I I see. So you can have various sort of very tough, strong women who just look like very cross women all the time and i'm like that's i'm happy with that i'll i'll yeah. I'll, I'll drink to that <laughs> and, and they're like proud to get themselves involved with that element of their personality and their emotion you know exactly. like it's part of their fundamental ability to react and deal with things now i do like the shifters they are they are really really cool mm-hmm. and you're saying about warforged you would, would you think that would put you off playing one like is it is it one of those things where you would play one or are they really far down your list and you think you probably play a lot of other things before I think because I maybe it's just because I I think they're cool like I think the 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 idea of the story about maybe putting on stuff I think I would have them certainly as maybe minor characters in my campaign but actually playing one I think just because it's a story where they're like it's I feel like maybe it's maybe it's limited to that sort of uh, solo sort of like I need to find out more about myself and I need to do this and I can only do it through the power of friendship. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like that's obviously that's innate in every single Warforge. Whereas stuff maybe like say like Changelings or even Kalashtar, they have something, but they can change so differently. That said, Warforges can either be fighting for good or they can rebel against their programming and become. Uh, you know, fight the, that sort of righteousness, that fighting for them, almost like um, in Detroit Become Human, having the rise of sort of uh, mm. Ottomans who are just like, you know what, this is not right what, how you've treated us. So that could be quite interesting. But again, I don't know how that would work necessarily if you're playing a character and you're working with other people. I think for me, I'm I'm now more of that person who's like, okay, what works well in a group setting? Like, I don't mind having a bit of um, chaotic, sort of like a bit of tension, a bit of like, I don't agree with that. I don't mind saying that out loud. But if there's mm-hmm. if there's a character which definitely would take quite a lot of the limelight away from other players, even if it's just um, even a part of the story arc, I'd rather have make sure the other party members do get a say in it and do get a, a bit in it. And I wonder sometimes maybe the Warforge, you can get quite deep into it before investigating other other characters' uh, backstories. I guess. No, that's very very true. <laughs> Out of all these things, is there anything you think you'd add to or change in terms of if you were to throw things into your campaign, or would you be happy to kind of chuckle for in as they are, as they're written, really? So interestingly, there is one. Well, there's a couple of things. I think I think this might be feel really cool because I know again because we talked about high rollers just then. Um, in the Guardian class, I think it at the beginning. I'm sure you'll correct me if I'm wrong. Healing didn't work. It was a mending spell that I had to do, and they quickly changed that. But mm. I do like the idea of having that you can only mend certain aspects. So if you're if you're if you have a sort of crushing blow and it takes off part of your arm or it takes off and you can't necessarily heal it. You need to do several mending checks or you need to have someone who's proficient in tinkering tools and you have to go to these places to double check stuff. So is that with the Warforge, which I think that just adds a little bit more flavor to it. Because as we've said, like, they're not robots. They're not, um, you know, electronics that just, you know, die after three years. But I think general maintenance and upkeep, well, certainly when we get older in life and like you need a, a hip replacement or something like that, you're not going to heal that with magic necessarily. You yeah, might exactly. have have something else. So there's that. And then, so it's interesting, the Kalistar don't necessarily sleep. That's one thing. They they relive their, um, their, their connected spirits uh, experiences. So it's almost like they get visions. So one of the things they have is that they have resistances to magical spells and effects that cause them to dream, mm. but not sleep. And I was just a bit like, I, I, and I, I guess because it might be a bit overpowered, right? If you have some, you can't be forced to go to sleep, but then you have that with elves who can't be put magically to sleep. So I was like, I'd actually have that. I'd have that you you can't be put to sleep or you can't be made to dream like straight off. Um, yeah. But again, I don't know how how well that would work necessarily. I think I'd get uh, the clash. Died. I think I'd just get a little bit daunted by trying to put their dream world into the campaign full stop like mm. it seems very complicated and very much a lot of these things um i mean obviously they, they put out a book about um greek history in D recently mm. and, and they've got all kinds of sort of things where they've drifted into different cultures i feel like the clash tar heavily influenced by something mm. but i just can't put my finger on it and i feel like i'd ruin it if i tried to get involved too much they, that's um, fair 
like getting my head around what they are. Yeah, really I, think, I think you're right. Like it's it's such a big part of what the Kalashtar are. It's a bit, again, going back a little bit, um, talking about Mind Flayers and Gifzari, there's such a history there. That if you're going to have them in your world, then you've got to be aware of that, like putting that into your world that, yeah, you're going to have... You're gonna have mind flares. You're gonna if you're gonna have mind flares, you're gonna have uh, two very pissed off races against these mind flares, and this whole history of uh, of war and and, and bloodlust and stuff. And then going to the Kalashtar, where there is possibly an ongoing war in a plane far away, but it is affecting people right now. It's not something you can just like forget about. I think it's like it's something that impacts that player every single adventuring day. Um, which I, again, it's that sort of thing. It just never, it's, it's a part of their identity. But you have to treat it carefully and just double check. It's like, why are you playing this character? Are you doing it because it's it's a good role play thing, which is great. But then just think about the consequences that you you can have with sort of this backstory and like where what paths it could lead you down. Because like we said before, you can have it so that um, you have internal conflicts with this uh, the spirit that embodies you. And what happens when you? when you go against it is there something where you can have like almost like an, an oath breaker type thing where you go at odds to your spirit one too many times and then they leave you or they they're connected to you but you have an angry horrible presence in your head that you can't escape what does that mean for you what does that mean for like your mind link abilities or your ability to dream do you do you dream you know I guess it, would you, I mean would it be the same as madness or or something mm. along those lines or is it something less less severe than that mm. i mean I, I was just about to ask you is there any other reading you could do around any of this that you would sort of push people to but the, the one that really immediately gets into my head just with that sort of dual the duality of it and and trying to sort of get your head around that and i've totally lost the name of the game but the celtic um female warrior who goes through the game trying to not be mad oh, um, hellblade a senuous yeah senuous sacrifice that was oh. it Maybe I, I don't know if it's quite that extreme, but like that mm. the sort of that, that sort of esque feeling about the clash time, yes. and whether or not that you would maybe drift into that sort of relationship oh. or that sort of way that they they work, that sort of pushing against what you think is real and what you think isn't every time you go to sleep. Yeah, like it's uh, I could see that. Oh yeah. Anything else that you'd suggest? Oh man, that's just bringing back memories. That was such a good game. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I actually thought about like the Warforge a little bit. I was like, okay, like how would I make Warforge more interesting in my games and that? And of course, Ryan as Douglas Adams. He makes robots and and stuff like you have Marvin the paranoid android. You have doors that are very smug. You have all these sort of things. So I like the idea of giving personalities to mm. to these things that aren't necessarily. A, a, a steel sort of template a blank slate as it were so i thought that would be really cool yeah. to have warforged that have these odd quirks and personalities that, you, that might when you encounter them you're like oh okay and you're like someone's <laughs> someone that's been on their shift all the time a bit like in borderlands when you you deal with robots like claptrap or anything like that and <laughs> can you imagine a warforged like claptrap that would be incredible oh, god or oh, oh, maybe even the people that made them weren't boring straight laced individuals they were all a bit mad and a bit quirky so all the warforged they made were just all a bit mad yeah like, oh, i can see that artificism yeah. who made them i know who could that be um but in, <laughs> in terms of other sort of like quickly just other sort of recommendations so obviously i've, I've sort of said luna lovegood would be my sort of inspiration for like Kalastar, and then sort of shifting on the harry potter theme i was thinking of uh, remus lupin and uh, tonks uh, are the two very pivotal characters in the harry potter series as sort of the inspirations for shifters per se like tonks can transform bits of her face essentially uh, so that sort of idea of it rippling in and out and not necessarily leaning not going full uh, animalistic but definitely leaning into certain things that would be quite interesting mm. and then on the sort of flip side so looking at changelings i've spoken about how much i love shira before but in shira in the last two seasons they introduced someone called uh, double trouble who is a technically a changeling and it's somebody who is mischievous who works with the bad guys essentially but then has their own agenda and it's constantly sort of like it's just like playing you know what i can do whatever i want i can be manipulative i can pit the princesses of power against each other and you know i'm not going to get caught so there's that smug element of them but obviously they do get caught because everyone realizes and then bands together and stuff but it's actually quite a cool um plot point because 
uh, when they shift, uh, double trouble, they shift into like a very small uh, girl who's just been saved, and she's all just like all constantly like, pointing out the obvious things, like, "Oh, well, she said to say this about you," and it's just great because you're like, "Well, no one would suspect a small, tiny girl." Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there's that and then finally again for maybe for, for shifters i did think of like supernatural and true blood mm-hmm. if you've ever watched those yeah, sort of yeah. terrible american sort of like we do we do supernatural things um but there's interesting like you have something with supernatural you have the the winchester brothers who go out and, and fight fight the good fight uh in there in, in iowa in kansas and iowa uh, which is great to, to see that <laughs> appear so often um but yeah the, the, again monster of the week where you have elements of these uh monsters that walk around or are trying to live their lives possibly uh, or are attacking like there's definitely some there's many episodes on like the windigos or wendigos sorry and oh wendigos are they are horrid oh duh. so but yeah having that sort of inspiration and putting those into the characters there so yeah just a small small smattering a small uh, sprinkle of uh, there's a lot of stuff to watch and take us a long time that's really cool <laughs> that's really really cool thanks for that that's an amazing chapter just lots of different ideas you could throw at people for four very different classes for you yeah yeah so well ryan what is our our next topic of choice what are what are we going to sink our proverbial teeth into next week well something tasty i i literally got I couldn't help but sort of look at what you picked and sort of go, oh, I'm making characters, got my head, got my imagination going. And I thought, well, how can we make some characters that are a little bit different? Something mm-hmm. you wouldn't normally do with a player character or maybe just an NPC. How, how would you put some flesh on people that you wouldn't normally do? So we're going to be taking a look at the Volo's Guide to Monsters, which we've dipped into before. Mm-hmm. And we're going to have a look at monstrous characters. So yes. how you go about making players or NPCs from classes or races that aren't necessarily geared naturally to being friendly or civilized put it that way i am so hyped for this i i can't wait to see what we come up with what we talk about it's going to be it's going to be amazing (laughs) (laughs) but until then you will have to wait because we will hear you soon very good and uh until next time (laughs) all right oh no no No. hang on (laughs) you need to say something about yourself yes go on (laughs) Pitch yourself. I can tell. I can tell you. You need to do it. How, I, I do. I do. How are things going with your podcast? Are they going well? I, I, by the time you've heard this, they're going to go brilliantly, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> so I am. I'm Fiona Howitt. I don't know why I gave my last name there. It's probably because we talked all about names, you know. Because I for the oh, this is boring now. But when I was younger, <laughs> everyone just called me Fee, and like you do it as well. Like friends call me Fee, but not Fiona. The only person that called me Fiona or Fiona was my mother when she was very cross with me. So now, oh <laughs> so. Anyway, forget all that. My name's Fiona. <laughs> I run the What Am I Rolling podcast, which is a twice monthly RPG one shot podcast. Um, it is going incredibly well. By the time this is out, which is going to be months down the line, not only have I done a panel at UK Games Expo, but I've actually uh, just today, it's been confirmed, today as in recording day, um, that I'm running a D&D one shot for some people for UK Games Expo on Saturday uh, before the panel. Yeah, it's uh, it's been great. I now I now need to write an, uh, an encounter for it that's only an hour long. So that's, oh, wow. that's super good. <laughs> well, there you go. Well, maybe you can put a changeling or a shifter in. <gasps> And then you could exactly really, really have to look them. back and go, hey, we know where that came from. We know where that came from. Uh, Ryan, do you have anything you'd like to plug? Oh, well, myself, c- come and find me. I'm on YouTube my, I, under the algorithm or the, the Julius of Ursa Ryan. So come and find me. I have a Discord. You can come chat to me about D&D or anything else you say, please. <laughs> All right. You want to do your reason. outro now? <laughs> Within reason. <laughs> Within reason. Within reason. <laughs> yes, I'd love to do my outro. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. It has been great to have you around. And until next time, we'll see you later. Bye. My uh, my document has changed this slightly to from shifters to a word we will pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually yeah. oh my god it's also put so it's put it like that and then also because it, it talks about it also refers to them as the wear touched but it's it, again it's changed it to we're touched uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're touched by the what i'm sorry uh, mm-hmm. so shifters <laughs>